morning, everyone. My name is Lita McKellar and I am Lakehead Sustainability Coordinator. I'm very pleased to be with you here this morning. Welcome to the final presentation uh, of our Research and Innovation Week 2022 Research Showcase. This year, the theme of Research and Innovation Week, uh, if you don't know already, but you probably do at this point, it, it's planetary stewardship and it's in support of the university's year of climate action. And Research and Innovation Week is understanding planetary stewardship as the act of respecting and caring for our home, Mother Earth. And we know that it's clear that humans need urgently to change their ways if we're to be honest stewards. And in particular, uh, science demands human action in response to climate change. And so Yoka is really born out of that context. We know we have a critical window of opportunity to act on climate change. And Lakehead's year of climate action is our next step in responding to that call. The year of climate action, it's really about creating the possibility for change that's amplified when we work together. And it's our invitation to departments, offices, individuals, student groups, community members, everybody involved at the university and beyond to think about how climate action connects to the work you're doing. And we've seen many events and initiatives and concrete climate actions come out of it. And I'd like to just thank our, our passionate team of faculty, staff, and students who have been coordinating the Year of Climate Action uh, throughout this year. So please visit uh, lakeadu.ca slash yoka, that's Y-O-C-A, to learn more uh, and see what, what future events are lined up as we've, we've still got more uh, in, the, in the roster. And I'll just put a plug for our Lakehead Climate Action Symposium, which is May 2nd to 4.30 p.m. And that's really gonna be a wonderful place to have community, community discussion about what did Yoka accomplish? And just as importantly, what's next? What did we learn from it? And where do we go from here? So this year's research showcase features presentations by leading climate change researchers, both at Lakehead University and other institutions. We're so honored to learn from these researchers and the innovative work they're conducting to respond to climate change. We know that transformative change is really created by the accumulation of all of these different actions and, and research and so on. If you're participating in uh, the gamification of Research Week and you're hoping to get some prizes, the gamification code for today is hashtag Yoka, again, Y-O-C-A. I would also like to recognize that in Thunder Bay, we are on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. And in Aurelia, Lakehead University resides on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people and of the Rama First Nation. And the Anishinaabe called the areas now known as Thunder Bay and Aurelia home for thousands of years before they were settled by Europeans and continue to be active leaders in their territory. And I wanna say a land acknowledgement honors and recognizes the historical and current presence of indigenous peoples and their rights to and relationship with the land that non-indigenous people now call home. But land acknowledgements are more than statements. They call for the ongoing recognition of the protocols and processes of local indigenous peoples. And like other acts of reconciliation, they must be followed with continued and meaningful concrete actions. I'd like to recognize that indigenous communities have uh, and continue to be, to be active leaders, especially in the areas of climate change, among other areas. And there are many Indigenous authored resources that you can learn more about how, how you can further climate justice in particular. And I encourage you to seek them out if you haven't already. Uh, one such example can be found uh, with the Indigenous Climate Action Network, which has a lot of resources, podcasts, uh, reports, and uh, other things that you can learn from. I also want to honor the fact that over the last three decades, Indigenous peoples have advanced and advocated for some of the strongest climate policies and actions rooted in their rights, their language, culture, and identities. Um, and for example, as was recently revealed in an Indigenous Environmental Network report, Indigenous resistance has stopped or delayed the equivalent, equivalent of 25% of annual U.S. and Canadian greenhouse gas emissions, and their work has stalled many projects that could have accelerated admissions, which I think is very substantial. We created the Year of Climate Action to be, like I said, a platform to bring together all members of our community to listen, learn, and share, but most importantly, act on climate change and climate justice in particular. 
With that, I'm very excited to introduce our final presentation in the research showcase, uh, Climate Change and Political Action, Lessons from India, Uruguay, and Canada. And it's my a, a special pleasure to introduce our moderator, or one of our moderators, Dr. Doug West. Dr. Douglas West is an associate professor in interdisciplinary studies and political science. And he's the editor of four books, including From Our Eyes, Learning from Indigenous Peoples, and the author of three editions of the Instructor's Manual for an Introduction to Government and Politics. He's also contributed over 20 articles, chapters, reviews, and editorials to scholarly journals uh, and edited works in the area of Canadian political thought, Indigenous political ideas, Northern politics, and the politics of food. And I also want to note that Dr. West is really committed to developing community service learning and community-based research. And indeed, he has welcomed myself into his classroom to have students conduct research for the Office of Sustainability, which I've been really grateful for. Uh, and in addition to serving on many Senate committees, he has also contributed for many years to our University Sustainability Stewardship Council. So I'm grateful to Dr. West for his service. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you. Dr. West. Thank you very much, Lita. Uh, for those of you who don't know Lita McKellar, she is a stalwart defender of sustainability and uh, a welcome addition to this campus, uh, to both campuses in, in terms of just raising awareness of sustainability. So Yoka is really uh, an accomplishment of, of her and her stewardship council, which is, is very active on, camp on both campuses. So I, uh, I wish them all well, and I thank you uh, for that kind introduction. So today we have a panel. Uh, we have a panel of, of folks who I know fairly well. Um, I've, I've been here for 30 years. I've got to know all of you in some form or another. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce you as a, as a panel first. And then when you each do your, your individual presentations, I'll introduce you even better. How's that? So uh, just let me share my screen here. and. Here we go. And I'm just going to start my, I just have three little slides here. So, so our first, my first slide indicates the order of the day. Uh, we are, we're very pleased to have with us today, Pallavi Das, who's um, in the history department. She'll be uh, giving a talk on people's climate knowledge versus scientists' climate knowledge. And I've heard her speak before. It's quite a treat to, to hear how she weaves uh, her understanding of, of uh, her subject with her appreciation of the communities she works with in uh, the Western Himalayas in India. And then we're gonna hear from Ron Harpel, who is, should everyone should, at Lakehead should know who Ron Harpel is. Um, he's working tirelessly on everything from film production to writing books to, uh, he's just been a wonderful colleague over the last uh, 30 or. 25 years, you've been here a little less than I have. Um, he's going to be talking about revolution on the pampas, a brief history of agroforestry in Uruguay. And I know Ron could probably give you a non-brief history of agroforestry in Uruguay as well, but we're holding him to 15 minutes today if we can. Uh, and then finally, we're going to hear from Paul Berger, uh, a colleague from the Faculty of Education, uh, who has been working with me on a number of different uh, um, panels before. Uh, and he's going to talk about Canada's response to uh, an inaction on climate change this time, uh, this year. So what we're going to be doing is 15 minutes or so of presentation, five minutes of uh, me maybe asking one question if we can get it in, and then we'll go through the panelists. And at the end, um, we will ask Michel Beaulieu, to, uh, who is the uh, Assistant Vice Provost, Associate Vice Provost, sorry about Michel to moderate audience questions to the panel. So if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Please don't raise your hand until we get into that section. Um, and so this is the order of the day. I want to also draw your attention to the fact that this session is brought to you by the Faculty of Education, the Department of Political Science, the Department of History, and probably the, the catalyst for all of this is the fact that we have two branches of the Canadian International Council, um, one in Thunder Bay, which has been around for as long as I've been around Thunder Bay, um, and uh, even longer, and uh, a new chapter in Simcoe County, which we started this year. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the CIC as a 
just a prelude to the conference or the, this session. We have 19 branches across seven provinces. I uh, encourage all of you to go to the CIC.org and have, it, have a look at that. We have, as I said, Thunder Bay and Suco County branches. If you want to become a member, there are 150 events plus per year, most of which are on Zoom now, and you can have access to all of those for a very, very low fee. Um, you also get access to the International Journal. You get access to uh, academics and public interest groups and NGOs who are all members of the organization. And we also have the Open Canada, an online magazine that you have access to that's available in English and French. And this year, uh, or last year, I guess the uh, CIC took on the custodian, uh, custodianship or the stewardship of the Kuchichi Conference, which is uh, an event that used to happen every year up until 2017 for about 50 years in a row uh, at Geneva Park in, uh, in Aurelia on the territory of the Ramaphorce Nation. And uh, now we're going to be doing a uh, Kuchichin Conversation Series this year. So look for that, Zoom hybrid gatherings, August to November uh, in Montreal, Toronto, Aurelia, hosted by our own Cynthia Wesley Eskimo, and uh, in uh, Victoria, hosted by me. So I also want to point out that we have two student members in the audience, two new student members, and the idea is to try and publicize the CIC as much as possible. So this is why we got them to sponsor this panel. Michael Abernethy and Evan McCarty are both students of political science. Michael is currently in his third year of the honors program and Evan is a graduate. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass over to uh, my good friend, Palabi Das. And as she gets ready, I'm going to uh, talk about her contributions to research. Palabi is, uh, she joined Lakehead in 2009, has taught uh, in areas like world history, environmental history, modern South Asian history. She has was uh, eight years at the Thunder Bay campus. And recently I gave her my office uh, in Aurelia. I we treated offices because I am retiring in June and she deserves a better office than she had. So I gave her mine. Her research interests specialize in South Asian history, world history and environmental history. And most importantly, her work um, uh, sponsored by Shirk is to do uh, to work with the farmers in north, near the who who uh, are working in the northern Himalayas. I'll let her uh, talk to you about that. Um, and uh, she's also the founding director of the Resource Resources Economy and Society Research Group Research at Lakehead, which is also funded by a Shirk Aid to Small Universities grant. So over to you, Pallavi. Thank you, Doug. Um, I would like to start off by first uh, thanking all the organizers of the Research and Innovation Week, uh, the departments that are involved, such as political science, history, and education. And of course, the Thunder Bay and Aurelia branches of the CIC for organizing this panel. Last but not the least, I would like to acknowledge uh, Shirk's Insight Development Grant, without which this uh, project would not have been possible. They provided the money, the funding for this, and a part of it I'm going to present today. So let me start by sharing my screen. All right, right ahead. Okay, so um, we know that um, the existing literature on understanding climate change and developing adaptation strategies clearly highlight the fact that scientific knowledge by itself is inadequate and that it should be complemented by local knowledge um, so that adequate adaptation strategies can be devised. The underlying assumption in these studies is that both the systems of knowledge are different and that therefore the adaptation strategies are different. But are they really different? So the aim of today's uh, presentation is to examine the above assumption by unearthing the local climate change knowledge of apple farmers in the Western Himalayan state of Himachal Pradesh in India, 
an area that's experiencing drastic climate change. In this ecologically sensitive mountain, mountainous region, it is the poor apple farmers with very small land holdings that are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. I use the term people's climate knowledge to refer to these farmers understanding of and response to climate change and consequently compare it to that of the scientists. So people's climate knowledge, as I use it, is ordinary people's understanding of climate change, which is shaped by their experience of climate change and which in turn shapes their response to climate change. This knowledge is built on their past experiences and adaptations to the changing climate and is part of the local knowledge system. So I'd like to show you the area that I'm talking about, my study area, which is uh, located in north uh, western part of India in the western Himalayas, the state uh, or the province of Himachal Pradesh, where 90% of the people live in rural areas and are engaged in agriculture, forest and horticulture based livelihoods. It's also known as the horticulture state of India and within the crops that are produced as part of the horticulture, apple accounts for 50% of the area under horticulture production and it's the most important cash crop of the province. In recent years, however, the production of apple has been negatively affected by poor snowfall, unseasonal precipitation and drought. And these uh, changes in the climate and climatic conditions have also resulted in apple cultivation shifting from the lower altitudes to the higher altitudes. Now, apple is not indigenous to this area. And uh, in 1904, an American missionary Samuel Stokes, who later took on the Indian name Satyanand Stokes, uh, introduced the commercial variety of uh, apple, which is, which is largely grown in Himachal Pradesh today. So by the 1950s, apple became a commercial crop and soon began to replace other crops which were being grown for subsistence. And one such district where apple is predominantly produced is Shimla, which accounts for 57% of total apple production of Himachal Pradesh. And about 80 to 90% of apple cultivation today in this district is done by small and marginal farmers whose land holding is less than one hectare and who are completely dependent on apple cultivation for their livelihood, making them not only vulnerable to the vagaries of the market, but also to the changing climatic conditions. Here you get a view of the apple orchards and you can see from the terrain, um, you know, it's uh, grown on the slopes, all scattered. Uh, you barely have, um, you know, flat areas for growing. And this makes it particularly difficult and only 10% of the land in uh, Himachal Pradesh, which is a mountainous uh, part of um, India, only 10% of the land can be actually cultivated. So um, during my study, when I um, you know, was engaging with the farmers and, and interviewing them, apple farmers I found were very observant of climatic changes, especially those that affect apple production. Overall farmers noticed changing climatic conditions, including untimely rainfall, increase in temperature that adversely affected the budding, flowering, fruit setting and apple production. The farmers noted that shorter winters or delay in snowfall, especially in December and January, led to fewer chilling hours and affected apple production. They also noticed increased frequency of uh, hailstorms known locally as uh, Ola, which began to adversely affect their crops. And you can see from this picture how the apples have been damaged by hailstorms hail uh, storms. Now in response to this frequent hailfall, the local government, the provincial government installed what are known as anti-hail guns, which you can see from this picture, but the farmers felt that these guns were not useful 
and um, their impact was limited to a small area. Also, during my fieldwork trip, I noticed that the apple farmers, especially the ones who owned big orchards, uh, had covered their trees with anti-hail nets or hail resistant nets. Um, and the marginal farmers, of course, could not afford these nets as they're expensive. Apart from climate change directly affecting apple productivity, farmers reported an increase in existing diseases and occurrence of new diseases in apple trees due to climate change, which affected apple quality and production. Um, insects, and one such uh, disease you can see on this uh, tree here, the woolly apple aphid infection, and then there's a insect uh, borers, uh, which uh, basically destroy the roots of the trees. So all these have increased uh, more recently because of changes taking place in climate. So higher temperatures result in an increase in, for example, the borer insects, which affect the roots of the apple tree. Most farmers attributed the change in climatic conditions to human activities such as deforestation taking place locally and also to other phenomena such as increased urbanization, industrialization and increase in population growth. However, the apple farmers I interviewed were not aware of climate change as a global environmental phenomenon. Many farmers believe that they cannot do anything to mitigate climate change as it is in the hands of God. They've accepted climate change as fate accompli, that it is inevitable and they cannot change it and they're helpless. Yet those who have resources, those farmers who do have resources are trying to cope with climate change in broadly two ways. What I call is one is the technological fix and the second is the geographical fix. So the farmers who can afford and can cope or in, in order to cope um, have adopted certain uh, strategies. The first kind is that is what I call as the technological fix, where uh, the farmers uh, have begun to use more fertilizers to improve productivity, use pesticides to get rid of diseases, and of course use hail nets to stop uh, hail damage to the apple crop. However, because rainfall is unpredictable and all these orchards are dependent on rainfall because of lack of irrigation facilities um, and droughts are quite recurrent in the area, fertilizers really do not work because they need a lot of water. So unless you're a, a wealthy farmer, you cannot afford to have a perennial supply of water uh, to use the fertilizers effectively. Also fertilizers, as we know, um, work in the short term, but in the long term, they damage the soil. Also, increased use of pesticides has led to pest resistance, uh, and also pesticide use has resulted in the decline of bees and other beneficial insects that are responsible for the pollination of apple flowers and therefore apple production. Anti-hail nets are another technological fix to deal with uh, frequent hailstorms. However, uh, the use of anti-hail nets has resulted in increase in temperature and therefore increase in the incidence of mites in apple trees for which farmers have to now use mite sprays. So poor farmers cannot really afford these anti-hail nets, yet because apple farmers are dependent on a single crop for their livelihood, they're forced to buy anti-hail nets. Uh, so much so that the demand for anti-hail nets, given the climate change that's taking place, has led to 100% increase in their sales between 1990 and 2017, and has emerged as a profitable commodity for anti-hail manufacturers and sellers. Similarly, there has been an increased sale of fertilizers, pesticides, and insecticides produced by local as well as multinational corporations. So the adverse impact of climate change on apple productivity has actually created opportunities for corporations to profit from the climate state, from the climate crisis. So this clearly resonates with what Naomi Klein has talked about, uh, that is disaster capitalism, where cap capitalists basically benefit and profit out of these uh, climate disasters or climate crisis. Um, in the future, as climate change intensifies its impact on apple 
productivity, other technological fixes such as disease resistant varieties of apple, high density plantations, early yielding varieties of apple may become sources of profit for biotech corporations. As we know, in a capitalist society, every problem is a business opportunity. So the technological fix for the people is also a commercial fix for business. Moving on to the second um, way in which uh, the farmers are adapting to a climate change, what I call uh, as geographical fix. Farmers are resorting to geographical fix in moving apple cultivation from the lower altitudes to the higher ones as more moisture is retained there due to more snowfall and lower temperatures. In fact, the uh, president of their association, one of the Apple Growers Association, confirmed that the geographical shift in the apple belt to upper elevations has indeed taken place. And he said that in the 1950s, the elevation was 5,000 to 6,000. thousand feet above sea level being located at, at heights of 7,000 to 8,000 feet above sea level. So as temperatures rise and with low and uncertain untimely snowfall as well as rainfall, apple farming has indeed shifted to higher altitudes. However, those who can afford to buy additional land in higher altitudes are able to shift some of their cultivation there. Most farmers cannot do this because they are marginal farmers and uh, they've already invested a lot in their existing apple orchards. Um, given that the mountainous terrain of Himachal Pradesh, only 10% of the land is available for cultivation, many of the small and marginal farmers have actually expanded their apple orchards into state-owned forest lands, which is considered illegal. This has brought them into conflict with forest officials who have started evicting the farmers from the encroached lands and have cut apple trees growing there. Moving on to the scientists who I also interviewed as part of my research, the scientists I found had the same indicators for as the apple farmers for climate change, such as variability of rainfall pattern, uh, alteration in snowfall pattern, decrease in snowfall amount, etc. However, unlike the farmers, scientists pointed to extra local phenomena such as glacial retreat, population decline in species of animals, rise in sea levels, extreme events such as drought floods, etc. And they attributed these extra local changes to global warming caused by increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, deforestation and urbanization around the world. Apart from their observations of climate change in Shimla district, the scientists also noticed the impact of these changes on apple productivity. They observed that change in snowfall pattern had, had resulted in chilling hours of less than 1,000 in apple trees, leading to erratic flowering and poor fruit formation. Horticulture scientists also confirmed that overall apple cultivation in the province has shifted from lower altitudes to higher ones. And they've noted that for every one degree rise of temperature, apple cultivation shifts upward by about 985 feet. And they also noted that the incidence of diseases in apples have increased and have become widespread. One example they gave was in the 1980s when apple scab became an epidemic disease. Also new diseases have also uh, started emerging as a result of climatic changes of temperature and moisture. With regard to the mitigation of impact of climate change at the local level, scientists say uh, that the farmers should adopt disease resistant and climate resistant varieties of apple trees. In fact, new varieties have actually been developed in India through the use of biotechnology. And you can see the picture here of the high yielding variety of uh, apple trees. And these varieties of apples require less chilling hours and can withstand higher temperatures and have already been introduced to those farmers who can afford to buy these uh, trees. Thus, according to the scientists, again, technological fixes will help apple farmers to adapt to climate change. So given all these changes in climate observed by farmers, um, I noticed that they are, these observations are closely tied to the cycle of the apple tree, 
which is not surprising given that apple cultivation is their main, main livelihood. So uh, when the natural cycle of precipitation and temperature has been affected by climate change, it has become increasingly out of sync with the natural cycle of the apple tree. Also, apple cultivation has made the farmers dependent on the market for their subsistence. They have to sell apples in order to buy farm inputs, such as fertilizers, apple seedings, etc., and of course, food for themselves. So any fluctuation in apple production, apart from increase in input prices and output prices, can impact their ability to sell apples for a profit and earn their living. Sudden changes in weather can contribute to fluctuations in apple sell, sale and thus in farmers' income. Overall, the apple farmers' accounts of climate change, uh, which are objectively rooted in their struggle to earn a living, match with the trends of average temperature precipitation based on meteorological records, on scientific reports and newspaper accounts. In fact, I, I was able to corroborate their, their um, ideas of climate change or their indicators of climate change. And I found that it complemented the meteorological data by providing details that are relevant to their livelihood, such as the timing of the rainfall and snowfall seasons that influence the health of apples and productivity of apple farms. Now, much of the existing literature on local knowledge and scientific knowledge points to fundamental contradiction between them. And my research has unpacked fundamental similarities as well as some differences between these forms of knowledge, that is between the farmers or people's climate knowledge and the scientists' um, knowledge. And uh, these similarities and differences are in the following ways. First, Apple farmers' view of climate change is similar to that of the scientists because their views are rooted in practice. Here, practice refers to the empirical examination of climate data by scientists and the real world experience of climate change by farmers. Because these views of nature or of society's interaction with nature are rooted in practice and not in irrational thinking, scientists and lay people are bound to have overlapping views, especially at the local level. However, unlike the scientists, farmers do not seem to be aware of extra local instances of climate change, nor are they aware of the deeper reasons or underlying mechanisms for climate change itself. Second, scientists and farmers are similar in terms of their ignorance about any possible social connection between climate change on the one hand and the overall socioeconomic system in which human beings interact with nature. The socioeconomic system in question is capitalism, which is based on two interrelated fundamental principles. One, commodification of everything, including nature, that is land, seeds, etc., And two, the market as an opportunity to make a living by earning money and the market as a constraint uh, you know, because one has to cut costs, one can suffer losses, etc. While changes in nature, including potential change in temperature or climatic change that we see, they occur in all societies, these changes attain a special character in a capitalist society where the main purpose of production is private profit. As a result, farmers' microscale adaptation to climate change in a capitalist society seeks to resort to two kinds of fixes that the expert, the scientific experts and government officials also recommend, which I discussed earlier, the geographical fix and technological fix. These fixes are ultimately commercial fixes for buying and selling for profit. This shows that a climate change adaptation strategy such as technological fix, which originates in the capitalist system of production for, for profit is itself becoming an opportunity to make profit in the business world. While the technological fix in the market can be an opportunity for some farmers, it can be a constraint for other farmers who are constrained to find adequate funds to adapt to climate change and are increasingly relying on precarious wage labor. So because common people and scientists underemphasize deeper social and economic causes of climate change, their views and adaptive strategies to cope with climate change are similarly limited. 
to conclude, contrary to existing studies and arguments, this study of climate change in the apple farming communities in the Western Himalayas has shown that people's climate knowledge is not very different from that of the scientists. They are similar, not just in terms of their suggestive adaptive strategies, but also more importantly, in failing to recognize that the root cause of anthropogenic climate change is the capitalist economy with its incessant drive for profits. Therefore, in order to deal with contemporary climate change in the long term, adaptive strategies and solutions have to resist and reject capitalism. Otherwise, ordinary people will be devastated by the impact of an unpredictable climate. Thank you. And for further details, you can look up my article that was published on this very same study. Thank you very much, Pallavi. That was a wonderful presentation and, and certainly gives us a glimpse of what other parts of the world are having to deal with climate change. I wonder if I may just for a second um, ask you, you, you're now been living in the, well, you've always been living actually in Simcoe County in that area. And so do you, are you familiar with the apple production uh, farms that are, are all over Simcoe County and also mostly in the North as well. Um, and, and do you think there's any kind of way that your research could help them or, or bring apple farmers together on two continents to understand the impact of climate change and exchange kind of ideas? Um, yes, I'm aware that um, we do have, um, yeah, I think in the Meaford area, if I'm not mistaken. From, from Collingwood all the way over to Owen Sound, it's quite uh, filled right. with, with apple orchards, yeah. Yeah, um, I feel um, we're talking about two different groups of farmers here, mm -hmm. because I think uh, the Canadian farmers in the Simcoe County are much better off in terms of resources to cope with climate change. And that's why I think um, there are two different groups. One group that I'm focusing on is the one, you know, they're the marginal farmers who are more vulnerable to climate change. And um, when compared to um, the farmers in uh, the Simcoe County who obviously have more resources. So um, in that sense, I do not see the transfer of knowledge uh, taking place in, in that sense. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe, um, Canadians are benefiting from climate change uh, because the colder areas are becoming uh, more um, arable because of um, the, the temperature rise. So compared to tropical, semi-tropical regions, which are going to be drastically affected by climate change, I think uh, the case of Canada would be quite different. So mm -hmm. I do not see that kind of, uh, you know, transfer of knowledge being beneficial, maybe in the long, long term, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I mean, the subtitle of our session today is Lessons for Canada. I just wonder if you could derive any lessons for Canada out of your research in India. Uh, I would say, um, you know, when I ended, I said that um, the anthropogenic climate change uh, that we see has largely to do with um, the capitalist economy, because um, I don't know if you know of Jason Moore, who's an environmental historian, and his uh, book Cap Capital Capitalocene. I still cannot pronounce it properly. Uh, he replaces Anthropocene with Capitalocene, mm -hmm. uh, saying that uh, you know you should not shift the blame to consumers. Uh, rather the corporations and capitalists. So, um, you know, 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global uh, industrial greenhouse gases, um, which they calculated in 1988. So I would say, you know, um, maybe those the farmers, if they can come together and if they are affected by climate change, uh, there would be an international coalition of people uh, like we find in the uh, climate justice movement 
mm -hmm. who can be uh, who can come together and question the system the socioeconomic system that is actually creating this you know no matter how much we recycle how much we do our bit um, overall the corporations are the ones that are uh, creating much of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions so I think we need to go to the root of the matter and I guess that's what I'm trying to highlight uh, through my research. We, we need to make a shift as well don't we um, not just to adapt to climate change but to adapt to uh, feeding the world as well and uh, yeah. yes. many things. Um, thank you very much Pallavi it was wonderful to hear you again and to see you again and I look forward to doing that again. Um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, I, I'll, I'm going to ask the audience to wait for uh, for Pallavi to ask questions of her at the end of after we hear from Dr. Harpel and, and Dr. Berger. So um, I'm going to shift now over to Ron Harpel. And if you can, there he is. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. Uh, Ron Harpel is um, a full professor in the history department who uh, is just a, a, a whirlwind of activity, <laughs> has been since he arrived on campus. Uh, he teaches international development, social justice, human rights, Latin American and Caribbean history. Um, he teaches graduate, undergraduate courses. Uh, he's at, at the same time as he does all this, he's also a director of a media lab that focuses on documentary films and new media as knowledge mobilization in the social sciences and humanities. And he's he is just a, a marvelous uh, colleague, and, and I, I won't go into too much more detail. He's done so much work. Uh, please look up his, uh, you can look at his uh, CV or his, his brief CV on the Lakehead site. But the, the, the other thing I want to mention is that Ron helped me build my deck years ago uh, when I lived in Thunder Bay. And I, I don't know if I ever thanked you, Ron, but I'll thank you right now in front of everybody else. So over to you. and. Uh, um, Ron will be telling us about forestry in Uruguay. Go ahead, Ron. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess uh, what I have to say about uh, your uh, introduction of me is that if you um, are around long enough, then uh, your CV uh, gets to be more and more impressive uh, looking, but you have to be around long enough to be able to, <coughs> to uh, have that kind of CV. So um, I was given 15 minutes, and um, what I decided to do today was uh, uh, kind of provide a a contextual history of um, agroforestry um, in uh, Uruguay. Um, and um, um, I'd like to uh, really begin uh, by telling you that, um, oh, first I should tell you what the title is. Uh, you already know what it is, but it's and I've called it a brief history of agroforestry in Uruguay. And uh, I borrowed uh, part of the title from James Scobie, who published a book uh, many years ago called Revolution on the Pampas. Uh, and it was a, the subtitle was A Social History of Wheat in Argentina. And, uh, and so uh, that's where my title comes from. And uh, what I'd like to begin by um, uh, doing is uh, telling you, that, uh, explaining a little bit about uh, shifts in the global forest industry. So over the last 35 years or so, there's been a, a major shift uh, from the global north to the global south uh, for uh, the production of uh, forestry products. Uh, in the case of Uruguay, it's pulp, uh, not pulp and paper, uh, in case I forget to mention that later on. Um, uh, but uh, in Latin America, it was uh, uh, Brazil and Ch Chile that uh, led the way, and now there are many other um, uh, countries that uh, are interested uh, in uh, developing uh, plantations, uh, agroforestry and plantations uh, to develop a forestry industry. And uh, you can find this in uh, uh, many, many countries in Latin America. Um, the shift from the north to the south, of course, uh, has to do with uh, many things. Um, I think a big part of it uh, really um, is uh, the cost of labor and uh, the cost of production. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, those kinds of things a little later on. Um, what I would like to uh, do is um, also um, uh, give you sort of a background, if you will, to uh, this agro, uh, to the history of uh, the, the development of uh, agriculture in, uh, in Uruguay. Um, you should, uh, when you look at agroforestry in Uruguay and uh, elsewhere, you should see it as sort of an extension of the Green Revolution from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, essentially, it has the same attributes, uh, ge genetically modified uh, plants, 
uh, use of fertilizer, expansion in scale, uh, and the variety of other uh, innovations that, uh, that were brought to us. And of course, it has all the same sort of uh, implications for uh, a country like uh, Uruguay, which uh, was accustomed to, which already had uh, large uh, tracts of land uh, owned by um, um, a relatively small number of, of landowners. Uh, it has the same sort of impact on Uruguay as a, a country like that as it would on a country with uh, many small farmers that uh, were expropriated for uh, the introduction of new crops, uh, etc. So when we look at Uruguay, uh, we have to start uh, really at the beginning. When the Spanish uh, first arrived in uh, Uruguay, um, the, what they discovered uh, in Uruguay and neighboring Argentina were vast plains. Um, when I, I go to the region, I grew up in Manitoba and it reminds me very much of Manitoba, except that uh, they have uh, palm trees and uh, Manitoba doesn't have any palm trees. Um, it's a uh, 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 grassland. Uh, there were um, um, there were no large um, uh, civilizations or uh, or large uh, indigenous groups. Uh, the indigenous group uh, on the land um, in the, the 1530s, when the Spaniards first uh, arrived in Uruguay, uh, were called the uh, Charua, and um, they uh, were eventually pushed off of the land. Um, there were no uh, precious metals, uh, and so the Spaniards basically stopped in Uruguay, looked around. A few people attempted to colonize Argentina and, uh, and Uruguay in the early colonial period, but for the most part, the Spaniards uh, concentrated on the big uh, uh, empires of, uh, of the north, the Aztecs and the, uh, and the Inca uh, and uh, other areas where there were large concentrations of uh, indigenous peoples. Um, uh, Argentina and, and Uruguay uh, also did not take the route uh, of, uh, say, the Caribbean islands uh, or Brazil uh, in that they did not uh, import very many slaves. Uh, slavery was not uh, very important in those two countries or in Uruguay, therefore, um, there was uh, no, um, I guess, need for labor during early colonial period. And that just tells you a little bit about the, the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the landscape. So moving ahead uh, quite quickly, um, Uruguay uh, remained under uh, the jurisdiction of Buenos Aires uh, uh, until its independence in, uh, with the rest of Latin America at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, in um, 19, uh, 1831, uh, actually on the uh, 11th of April, 1831, uh, the first president of Uruguay, um, uh, 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 sent a uh, 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 an army uh, to um, to uh, a meeting that was um, uh, where the last of the Chirua were were attracted to uh, the uh, according to to the records the Chirua were uh, fed alcohol and then uh, it go, it's called the massacre of uh, Sao Quipuedes, but they massacred uh, essentially the the, the remaining. Uh, indigenous people uh, on the on the, the land. Uh, importantly, though, it uh, happened at a place called Sal Sipuelis, which translated into English means uh, get out if you can, or flee if you can. <clears throat> so uh, with the uh, uh, plains uh, cleared of uh, its original inhabitants, uh, the uh, colonists uh, began um, uh, staking land claims uh, across the Pampas region. And uh, in the early uh, 19th century, there really wasn't very much that uh, they could produce for export, um, but uh, there were wild cattle. Uh, and uh, gradually, uh, over the course of the next uh, maybe 50 years, uh, those cattle uh, were uh, reined in, uh, fenced in when, with the introduction of barbed wire in the 1860s, and uh, also uh, markets uh, began to develop for uh, meat products. Traditionally, uh, they salted meat, uh, beef, and uh, sold it in barrels uh, for export. Uh, then in uh, 1862, a, a man by the name, a chemist, a German chemist by the name of uh, Hustus von Liebig, um, established a uh, uh, began establishing uh, a, um, uh, a complex or an industrial complex to uh, produce uh, what essentially uh, became the trade name is OXO. You're all familiar with it, but uh, beef cubes in 1865. In fact, Jules Verne made uh, reference to them in his book, uh, The uh, Voyage to the Moon or the Moon Voyage, um, and uh, uh, discussed uh, the, the OXO as, uh, as I suppose, the, the food that astronauts would be using. And uh, I was going to do some research to see if astronauts uh, eat OXO or drink OXO, 
uh, these days. Um, I'm quite sure they're doing something uh, like it. Uh, anyhow, the beginning of the, uh, the uh, Liebig plant um, created uh, new opportunities and uh, it wasn't long before the Liebig plant uh, was, was uh, 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 processing um, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of cattle per year. By 1900, the early 20th century, uh, approximately half a million cattle per year were being uh, slaughtered in the that one um, one um, processing plant. Uh, throughout Argentina, there were many other processing plants that uh, grew as well. And then in the 1870s, of course, uh, refrigeration was introduced and it introduced a whole new opportunity for um, the exploitation of the land and the increase in the amount of uh, cattle that were put on the land, etc. Also in the late 19th century was the introduction of the grain economy and uh, as markets grew uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world for uh, these uh, products, uh, grain and beef became the um, mainstay of the Uruguayan uh, economy um, up until uh, the end of the uh, 20th uh, century. What we need to uh, also understand um, uh, about um, this, uh, this transition is that uh, it came um, at a particular time. So um, the, I mentioned uh, early on the, earlier on the, the Green Revolution. Uh, the Green Revolution sort of came uh, hand in hand with the oil crisis of 1973, the debt crisis of uh, the early 1980s, the uh, introduction by uh, the IMF and uh, um, World Bank uh, of uh, neoliberal uh, policies. Um, and um, uh, the advent, I suppose, of uh, this uh, third, what has been referred to as a third wave of uh, globalization. The, uh, the uh, 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 Uruguay um, also had a very strong uh, political uh, uh, tradition. Um, it was uh, considered to be largely democratic throughout the uh, 20th century. Um, the meat processing uh, industry attracted uh, immigrants, uh, and Uruguay is very different that way, um, but it attracted immigrants primarily from Italy and from Spain, and with the immigrants came politics, and uh, they brought with them uh, at the turn of the 20th century, their, uh, uh, th at the turn of the 20th century, they, they brought with them uh, syndicalism and uh, began organizing, uh, not only in the uh, meatpacking industry, uh, but also politically and uh, developed political parties. And uh, for the most part, the 20th century was uh, reasonably uh, democratic in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Latin American terms. Uh, of course, there was uh, a major problem. Uh, large landowners uh, own most of the, uh, the land in the, in the country, and uh, there was very little room for uh, smallholders, although there were smallholders, but uh, very importantly, um, Uruguay had an industrial working class uh, from the beginning of the 20th century up to the present. Um, in the, uh, the post-1945 period, um, the Uruguayan economy uh, began to falter in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, this, uh, in part, gave rise to uh, leftist uh, insurgency. And um, finally, in 1973, uh, there was a, a military coup, uh, and it lasted till 1985. Uh, the military uh, coming to power um, essentially the same year that uh, the world was, uh, was um, uh, ensnared by the uh, oil crisis and uh, in power during uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, debt crisis that began in the early 1980s. Um, floundered uh, uh, significantly in terms of uh, its policies re with respect to um, the, uh, the country's economy. Therefore, uh, they welcomed the IMF and the World Bank and uh, their uh, desire for investments uh, and to promote investment in, in uh, Uruguay. And of course, uh, the trade-off was uh, much, many of the um, social uh, safety uh, aspects of the social safety net that had developed over the course of the 20th century um, with that strong labor movement and the progressive politics in Argentina. Uh, during the uh, last stages of the uh, of the dictatorship, 
uh, they, uh, the, the military began uh, uh, studying and developing a, an agrarian law. The agrarian law was introduced actually in 1987 with the first democratic government uh, after the dictatorship. But uh, you have to appreciate that uh, when you make a transition from a dictatorship to a democratic uh, government, uh, you always have to worry about the military returning. And therefore, the first uh, uh, the series of governments, actually the first 20 years of governments after the um, military coup, uh, the uh, politicians were very cautious about uh, not uh, 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 attracting uh, the, uh, too much attention from uh, the, the, uh, the military, and uh, they had to worry about the military uh, once again leaving their barracks and uh, overthrowing the government. So they played very safe and they continued the policies of the, uh, the government. As uh, uh, a result uh, of this, the um, uh, uh, governments, uh, the democratic governments uh, of uh, Ur Uruguay since 1985 or since 1987 when the law was passed have had their hands tied uh, with this new uh, um, um, forestry law. So now I want to give you just a little history of forestry in Uruguay and maybe a little history of, uh, uh, describe a bit more about uh, Uruguay's uh, situation. So uh, one thing that's very important is to note is that the uh, that Uruguay does not have any natural forests. There were uh, something like 400,000 hectares of land that were considered forests uh, in uh, Uruguay prior to 1987. Uh, in 1965, there was uh, uh, the first um, forestry law of any significance uh, was introduced and that was to promote uh, plantations to produce uh, primarily pine uh, trees that were used for the manufacture of uh, furniture and uh, for uh, fuel purposes and, uh, and construction. And, um, and uh, pension plans in Uruguay were responsible for investing in the, um, the uh, mill uh, that was uh, created in a small town called Quebras uh, Colorados. Uh, and that mill is still in operation. So that was the first law in 1965, and basically it was aimed at the domestic uh, market and uh, providing uh, domestic needs. Um, the other thing that you need to know about our Uruguay is that uh, the country um, occupies approximately 17 million um, hectares uh, of land, and about 16 million uh, hectares of that land um, is uh, uh, considered to be arable land and uh, agricultural land. Um, Uruguay also has a population of about 4 million people and half of them live in Montevideo. So um, uh, when you get out into the countryside, I said it looked like Manitoba. Well, it does look like Manitoba in that there are little clusters of, of uh, uh, communities uh, here and there and uh, farms uh, that are sp uh, spread out across the, the landscape. And there are uh, still uh, vast, vast uh, pastures uh, with cattle and uh, all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 1987 law uh, was uh, a different law. It was designed to attract foreign investment, and foreign investment uh, was attracted to it. The um, the uh, there are a number of uh, aspects of the law that are important, but very importantly, uh, the government uh, subsidized the planting of uh, trees. They didn't specify the trees, but uh, the primary uh, tree. Planted is uh, eucalyptus trees uh, that are used uh, to produce uh, pulp uh, today. Uh, they subsidized the planting of the trees, and at the time, uh, those trees uh, required uh, 25 years to reach maturity uh, to be a uh, harvest. In uh, the over the course of the last 35 years, uh, with uh, genetic engineering, uh, etc., those uh, same trees, um, uh, well, they're no longer the same trees in that they've been modified, and now uh, they reach. Uh, the, uh, the um, uh, optimal size at uh, 10 to 12 years. And, uh, and so uh, uh, in addition to uh, planting uh, plantations uh, across, uh, in various parts of uh, Uruguay, um, they also introduced new species. And of course, the eucalyptus plantations uh, are, uh, have very specific needs. They're monoculture, uh, uh, agriculture. Um, they um, uh, um, uh, eliminate the uh, the uh, the ground cover, the grassland, etc., um, because of the um, uh, oil that is in the leaves and the toxicity of the oil uh, to uh, grasses. Uh, they provide uh, shelter to uh, some uh, small predators. There aren't any large predators. 
an Uruguayan friend of mine, I asked him about predators. They have something like 12 million cattle in the country. And uh, I said, are there any predators? And he said, yes, about 4 million of us. Uh, so the, the only carnivores really of significance in Uruguay are the people that, that live there, I suppose. Um, anyhow, the uh, introduction of uh, eucalyptus brought with it uh, all kinds of uh, issues uh, for uh, Uruguay. The eucalyptus trees have uh, roots that go up to eight meters uh, down, therefore uh, draining the aquifer. Um, they uh, uh, alter the surface, uh, wind currents and uh, a variety of uh, climatic uh, changes take place as a result of the planting of these trees. They grow to be up to uh, maybe uh, 15 meters uh, in, in height, um, but uh, tend to be uh, shorter than that. They have a very small crown um, and uh, they um, uh, create a, a great deal of biomass. So uh, the plantations began uh, in uh, 18, 1987, uh, essentially the first plantings uh, began. And uh, remember there were only 400,000 um, uh, hectares of land that were considered forest at the time. Uh, and today uh, they are up to 2 million uh, hectares of land. And uh, the vast majority of that land that has been uh, planted with the plantations contains uh, eucalyptus trees. To uh, deal with um, the, uh, the, this wood fiber and uh, the, uh, the trees to, that were harvested, um, the uh, Uruguayan government also uh, worked with the major uh, multinational corporations and uh, the uh, country and the companies that were interested in Uruguay happened to be Finnish companies. Um, there are many other companies from different countries in the region and different uh, parts of the world, but the Finns uh, dominate the uh, pulp industry uh, in uh, Uruguay. Of the two million hectares, the three Finnish uh, mills there's a third mill coming on, on stream next year. These uh, three mills uh, now have approximately 500,000 uh, hectares of land devoted to, to eucalyptus, eucalyptus that belongs to the forestry companies themselves. There are many other smaller forestry companies and other forestry companies that have established plantains, uh, plantations, um, but their trees aren't made, maybe uh, ready for harvest yet. Um, and uh, they can also sell uh, their, their uh, uh, trees their logs uh, to the, the finished plants. There are uh, three finished plants. The, the first one was in Frey Bentos. And Frey Bentos is uh, interesting, I suppose, in that uh, that's exactly where the Liebig uh, meat extract was founded in the 1860s. And so uh, when you look at uh, uh, Frey Bentos from the Argentinian side of the river, uh, on the right-hand side of the town, uh, one bookend is uh, what is now called the uh, revolution, the Museum of the Industrial Revolution. The first industrial revolution in Uruguay was the meat revolution. And on the left-hand side is uh, a large plant that produces uh, 1.2 million tons of uh, pulp per year. No paper uh, is produced. The pulp is exported to uh, primarily China and Asian markets where there are paper mills and uh, the pulp is turned into cardboard boxes and packaging and uh, whatever else there is uh, for uh, return uh, to uh, the markets uh, of the world. Um, the second plant, so Frey Bentos uh, opened in 2008. Um, then the second uh, plant to come on stream, uh, and Frey Bentos is owned by uh, UPM. Uh, the second uh, uh, plant to come on stream is the uh, Montes del Plata, and uh, that is owned uh, by Stora Enzo, another Finnish company, and it has a capacity of 1.3 million tons and is uh, fully operational. Both of these uh, plants are on the uh, Uruguay uh, River, um, and uh, Frey Bentos is basically the last uh, deep port on that river, and therefore they can't build another mill uh, further up the river. A third uh, uh, plant, uh, this one of 2.1 uh, million uh, tons per year, is being built uh, in the interior, uh, and um, um, it is also owned by uh, UPM, and it should come on stream uh, in 2023. So just to give you some uh, scale here, the um, the uh, amount of pulp that is produced by these three mills in Uruguay uh, uh, is uh, approximately maybe 18 times the uh, amount that is produced in uh, uh, a single mill in uh, Northern Ontario. The average mill that closes in Ontario or in Canada is between 250,000 and 300,000 
um, uh, tons per year uh, of production. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the equivalent then is about 18 or maybe 19 uh, Canadian mills uh, that are now closed that are uh, being replaced by uh, pulp uh, mills, three pulp mills uh, in Uruguay. As you can imagine, this has uh, an enormous impact on society. Um, gauchos, uh, the people that used to round up the cattle and work in the cattle industry and all the rest of it, um, have been, become uh, lumberjacks. Uh, there are serious concerns about the uh, environmental impact of the eucalyptus plantations, and there are, uh, al although um, the, um, the forest comp companies are, are uh, Finnish, uh, and uh, they uh, do promote corporate responsibility, uh, and uh, they do uh, their best, I suppose, as corporations to mitigate the uh, the uh, destruction caused by uh, this kind of uh, uh, agricultural uh, production. Um, they, the fact is they are plantations and plantations aren't good for, for anyone. The other aspect of it, of course, is transportation in, in the country. Uh, the country's roads were never built for large trucks carrying logs uh, in that volume uh, across the country. So it's affected the infrastructure. And of course, the infrastructure affects everybody that else that has to use uh, the roads. Um, the, uh, the uh, I suppose the plus side of, of the, uh, this is that uh, the biomass is used to produce electricity and um, the, uh, when the three mills come into production, uh, they should be producing in the neighborhood of 20% of the country's electrical needs or 20 to 25% of the country's electrical needs uh, by burning the, the biomass. Uh, from uh, the, uh, the the pulp production, the uh, <clears throat> the other things, and I'm, I believe I'm running out of time, so I will make it uh, uh, short. But uh, you also have to appreciate uh, the the uh, social changes. Uh, ironically, where the build, mills are built, and they require about 5,000 uh, people working on them at one time to build them, uh, in those same areas, Fray Bentos, uh, Montes del Plata, Paso de los well, not yet Paso de los Toros. Um, you find that they have the highest levels of unemployment uh, in Uruguay. And that's simply because they attract uh, people who need jobs. Uh, when those jobs disappear in construction, there aren't enough jobs to replace, uh, to be replaced by the forest industry. And therefore they have a large amount uh, of unemployment. And this of course brings all kinds of social turmoil uh, to uh, those particular communities and changes uh, people's uh, relations with their neighbors, changes uh, virtually everything for people. I didn't mention women, Women, but there's the incorporation of women. Women are used uh, primarily in the greenhouses and uh, women's wages are lower than uh, men's wages. Therefore, they bring down wages in general um, because uh, companies would rather pay men less than pay women more to do the same work. And so um, that's the situation. Um, and uh, when we get to the discussion part, I can fill in uh, some other uh, aspects of it. But I guess the bottom line is for uh, people of Uruguay, for many people of Uruguay, it still is sal si puedes, get out if you can. Uh, simply because the, this is a monster of an industry, it's taking uh, land away from people, opportunity away from people, and uh, people uh, are fleeing to urban areas. I mentioned Montevideo. Well, many people are ending up in, in Montevideo and other larger communities in uh, Uruguay because they've been pushed off of the land uh, as a result of this expansion of uh, the forest industry and the loss of uh, opportunity for individuals to uh, access the land. Thank you very much and uh, we'll have a discussion soon. And if there are any questions, I guess I could answer one or two. Thank you very much, Ron. That was wonderful. I mean, most of us know a little bit about Brazil, but not very much about Uruguay at all. And I wondered if there's a connection. Now, obviously, there are. They're right beside each other. And Uruguay was a, was a, a sort of colonized by Brazil to some extent, I guess, it, when, it, when Brazil, you know, and, and they both became decolonized to some degree. Um, it seems like Brazil's going towards more deforestation in the Amazon, especially, I, I read this morning that there, the Amazon basin has now reached a point where it can't recover from the deforestation on its own. So there's gonna have to be a lot of mitigation there. And it's all related to the beef industry, as far as I understand, and our, our insatiable uh, <laughs> appetite for hamburgers all over the world. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about this in terms of the forestry 
the industry in Canada and, and its connection. And the Finnish connection is very interesting too, in terms of Thunder Bay and, and the area around Thunder Bay. Um, is is there a lesson here for Canada to learn about how neoliberalism works in 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 this kind of uh, environment where it cha changes the landscape by putting eucalyptus trees and changes the landscape in Brazil by deforesting for the purposes of agriculture and and, and farming uh, beef and cattle? Is there anything to be learned from this in Canada? Well, just uh, on your first uh, point, I'd just like to point out that what's happening in Uruguay is deforestation in reverse. Because, of course, the trees are occupying uh, grazing land and uh, and destroying that grazing land. The aquifers are drying up and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, chemicals and you're introducing a new species. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, issues associated with it in terms of the uh, the uh, plants and animals associated with or, or without uh, eucalyptus um, uh, cultivation. In terms of lessons for Canada, I'm not really sure um, um, what we would have in terms of lessons. Uh, for our forestry uh, industry. One thing that I can, uh, I, my personal observation, if you will, is that uh, things have gotten a little better around Thunder Bay, uh, simply because uh, when I drive out into the countryside, the trees are returning, all those clear cuts are gradually returning and with them come animals and, uh, you know, not necessarily a d diversification of the forest, but, but uh, you know, there, there are new, uh, uh, there's new growth and uh, it is changing the landscape. The problem, of course, is that once those trees uh, reach uh, uh, a certain size, uh, the, uh, the, the, the mills that have been closed uh, will be replaced uh, with uh, new mills and the wills, mills that remain open will be using that fiber to produce pulp and paper and uh, the products that, that they pr uh, produce as well. And that's going to, of course, have an adverse effect on uh, Uruguay. For the time being, uh, labor costs in Uruguay are much, much less than they are right. here. The social uh, safety net is much weaker in Uruguay than it is here. And so it's uh, economical and uh, profitable to be uh, in a place like Uruguay and not in Canada. And I characterize the forest industry in Canada as, as uh, hunting and gathering, as opposed to the plantation uh, kind of agriculture that, that exists in Uruguay. And I characterize the uh, plantation or the forest industry in Finland as more like farming, because that's how, what they refer to it as. But uh, they tend to tend to their, their, their forests and, and mm -hmm. uh, they, it's a different growth process. The, the thing that I didn't mention about eucalyptus that I just want to make one little point is that Remember, I said that the uh, the trees grow much much quicker now. Well, mm -hmm. they take the same amount of nutrients uh, as uh, they they would if they needed 25 years to reach maturity. So the depletion of the soil and the, the resources uh, are that much quicker. In, in when I was last in Uruguay, uh, they had they had already harvested sort of the first. Uh, uh, clones, the first uh, eucalyptus uh, clones that were 25 year trees, uh, but uh, eucalyptus uh, can come back three times. So you can cut it and it'll come back three times. They ripped up all of the, 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 the roots, the stumps, and replanted with these shorter growing um, uh, trees. And so it, even their, their initial plan of 25 years turnaround, planning for plants and, and exports and uh, infrastructure, all of that has sort of been accelerated by uh, gen genetically modified uh, trees. It sounds like an aggressive neoliberal capitalism at work yet again, taking advantage of the situation and accelerating the uh, the growth potential of, of, of species and, and changing the whole landscape, it sounds like. so. Uh, and, and this this session, uh, politics is a, is a part, climate change and political action. Right. From 2005 to 2015, uh, is, am I right? Anyhow, uh, the uh, Uruguayans had uh, Marxist uh, governments or Marxist in government. Jose uh, Mujica uh, was in under the dictatorship, spent eight years being tortured and in, as a political prisoner. Uruguay had the highest percentage of political prisoners in the world during the, uh, the dictatorship. They were surrounded by other dictatorships. And so what the, my point is, is that even when progressive governments, and though Tabare um, Vasquez's government, uh, there were two of them, and then Jose Mujica's, which was in between, uh, those um, three presidencies um, were uh, extremely progressive. Uh, and uh, and there was lots of change that took place in Uruguay, except in the forest industry. Their hands were tied, and uh, they are now uh, uh, obliged uh, to uh, to deal with the, the, this new forest industry, which has changed all sorts of. I'll discuss other things later, I suppose, or other points. But 
that's the situation. So even when there are uh, good politicians, uh, perhaps, or progressive politicians uh, in office, they can't necessarily make the kinds of changes. These are commitments over a very long term. Uh, it's a shift that cannot be turned around in the short term. Thank you so much, Ron. That was wonderful. Um, I look forward to the conversations we have at the end of uh, our last presentation. So we're going to switch now to uh, Paul Berger. Uh, Paul is uh, in the Faculty of Education. He's an associate professor. He's actually um, a, a minted PhD from the Faculty of Education program, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, in 2008. So he's he, he, uh, not only a, a student of, of uh, Lakehead, but also now uh, a faculty member. And it's uh, wonderful to see that happen. Um, he specializes in climate change education. And, and if you haven't seen his work or heard him speak, he's an activist. He's uh, very, very con connected to the community in, in, in Thunder Bay uh, and to some degree in Aurelia. And um, uh, also, though, spent years uh, working up north, way up north with the Inuit on, on educational pedagogies. And uh, so, um, you know, Paul's going to talk today about uh, the um, Canada's response to climate change, which is, uh, as I know, Paul, it's, you know, I know what he's going to say, is it woefully inadequate? But let's let's hear from Paul, and uh, and thank you very much for being here today. Right. Thanks, Doug. Thanks everybody for being with us. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Lita, for your um, land acknowledgement. I just want to add to that by saying that if Indigenous ways were being followed here and across the world, such as paying attention to the seven generations before and the seven generations to come, uh, we wouldn't have a climate crisis. But instead, uh, we have policy in Canada that really struggles to take the next half, half generation into consideration. And that means that it leaves the work of tackling climate change largely to others. I want to say up front that I'm a climate activist and I research climate change education, but I'm not a climate scientist or a political scientist. My talk is based on extensive reading and teaching, uh, not on a research study. And I'm really afraid that my subject isn't very uplifting. It's more infuriating, uh, enraging, and, and really embarrassing. Uh, but stay with me because I think it's important. Knowing about Canada's inaction and what it means for others can help bring motivation to push for change. I'll start by saying I take it for granted that I don't need to review in any depth the reasons why urgent action on climate change is needed. If you haven't been living under a rock, you've noticed that climate impacts have come to Canada uh, with wildfires, atmospheric rivers, landslides, droughts, uh, ticks carrying Lyme disease in Thunder Bay, 600 people dying under a heat dome in BC this summer uh, with a temperature of 49.6 degrees. But this is of course only the beginning. Uh, with an average global warming so far of 1.2 degrees Celsius. And it's in fact very little compared to the impacts in other parts of the world, um, such as uh, Pahlavi was describing in, in India, uh, where, where there's real impacts on real people, uh, taking people's livelihoods and, and creating enormous stress. Or in places like Africa, where climate exacerbated drought is threatening millions with starvation. Honduras, where back-to-back -back hurricanes earlier in the pandemic devastated the economy. And of course, there's nothing like the threat to low-lying countries like Kiribati, the Maldives, or Barbados, who say 1.5 to stay alive uh, because warming of two degrees will put them underwater, which would be a death sentence for their lands and cultures. And the most recent, we, we just keep hearing more, more bad news. The most recent IPCC report from just over a week ago noted that climate impacts are worse than we thought uh, for us and for virtually everything else on the planet. Uh, we're collectively more vulnerable than we thought and adapting will be more difficult than we thought or impossible in cases. As the Ugandan climate, uh, climate activist uh, youth Vanessa Nakate says, you can't adapt to death, you can't adapt to extinction. I said we didn't need to review why urgent action uh, is needed in any depth, but unfortunately while most Canadians want stronger action on climate change, there's a pretty low level of climate change literacy among the general population, and especially on the matter of urgency. And if actions are any indication, there's even lower levels among uh, elected politicians, and we'll come back to that. In their special 1.5 degree report in 2018, the IPCC provided a carbon budget, uh, which is basically the number of tons of carbon dioxide that could be emitted into the atmosphere with a 67% chance of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, 67%, that's pretty good odds, right? 
if you're a betting person, uh, that's a nice chance mm -hmm. of return. But it's not so good if you're getting on a boat with only a 67% chance of making it to the other side. So we're already in, in really dangerous territory. But before we talk about the carbon budget more, as a little aside, it took a teenage Swede, Greta Thunberg, to popularize the idea of the carbon budget. Uh, Bill McKibben had a much earlier article in Rolling Stone, but mainstream media didn't seem interested, and it was up to Greta to school the British and French parliaments and several international climate change uh, conferences on the idea. I'm going to start a screen share here to just show you the uh, cover of that report. And down on the, the bottom right, if it's not hidden by people, uh, it is on my screen. Uh, you'll see 420 uh, gigatons of carbon. That's 420 million tons, and that was as of January 1st, 2018, to probably keep uh, climate change to 1.5 degrees of warming. And it's pretty easy to do math with these numbers. There's almost 8 billion humans on the planet, and so dividing 420 billion tons of carbon dioxide by 8 billion humans, uh, we come up with 52.5 tons of carbon per person. So, so that is every human's carbon budget uh, or what they could emit into the atmosphere as of January 1st, 2018, uh, was 52.5 tons. And Canada's GHG emissions are about 720, uh, uh, 730 megatons a year, uh, a year, million tons a year. Uh, note how consistent this is. Um, it's not bending down as, as we should expect that it needs to. And that's if you do another division there with uh, 37 million Canadians, that's 20 tons per person. So 20 tons per person, 52.5 tons. Uh, that means out of for 2.6 years, uh, Canadians burn through their carbon budget. So that was about you know, July 6th of 2020. So what are we doing now? Well, we're burning through other countries' carbon budgets. So Canada is supposed to be heading for net zero by 2050 and 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. But in truth, we've already long since emitted our entire 1.5 degree carbon budget. I hope you find this troubling. Uh, Canada is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, a G7 nation with incredible advantages, and we're pissing away, and that's a technical term, any chance to lead on climate or even just to show up and not be ashamed and embarrassed. This isn't just a climate activist perspective. Last fall, the Climate Action Tracker uh, rated Canada's climate performance as highly insufficient, meaning that if everyone was doing what Canada is doing, we'd be on track for a four degree warmer world. Canada has so far set nine greenhouse gas reduction targets and missed nine. If I were a bit more charitable, I would maybe give some credit at least for consistency there. Here's Canada's Auditor, Auditor General's office. Quotes, we can't continue to go from failure to failure. We need action and results, not just more targets and plans. So why is Canada so utterly useless at paying attention to the science and acting in the bold and ambitious way that science demands? Well, certainly there's a number of factors. The key factor is the government industry nexus and the number of times fossil fuel companies lobby uh, various levels of government. This study uh, found that between 2011 and 2018, the fossil fuel industry contacted government officials more than 11,000 times, so six times per working day. And to be perfectly clear here, which is a phrase I hate when uh, Canadian politicians use it, the fossil fuel industry, which knows very well the urgency of tackling climate change, lobbies intensively to slow government action on climate change. We see this even at a very local level, uh, when a group of Thunder Bay citizens asked City Council to oppose the proposed Energy East tar sands expansion pipeline a few years ago, we were told that lobbyists had made many contacts with councillors and the Vice President of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers flew in to do a deputation to Council. And City Council defeated our request and immediately carried a motion to support the proposed pipeline. Okay, remember I said earlier that I would return to ca Canadians and especially politicians, uh, low levels of climate literacy. The industry capture of government is so complete that Justin Trudeau told an industry gathering, uh, you see the headline there and I quote, 
no country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them there. Now, this was after he'd signed and we'd ratified the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And this is the same prime minister whose government, uh, perhaps desperate to curry favor with Albertans, bought the uneconomic anti-reconciliation and climate disaster uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project from Kinder Morgan. And that's like taking a bunch of gasoline and pouring it on the fire. I don't buy that. Slide. Okay. Uh, advance. Okay. His core ministers of climate change had to then parrot the contention that it's in the public interest, uh, which was clearly idiotic, another technical term. This is a really major failure too, because as Seth Klein made very clear in his keynote on Monday, it sent the signal to Canadians that we're not in a climate crisis. Uh, when a past cl climate minister, Jonathan Wilkinson says that, you know, we're gonna use the profit from the pipeline to fund the green transition, it's of course laughable, but it again sends a message to Canadians that we're not in a real crisis. One other thing that might make you think we're not in a real crisis, when the Minister of Climate Change, uh, Jonathan Wilkinson's wife, owns stock in Enbridge and Royal Dutch Shell, uh, that, might, that might concern you and, and make you think we're not in a crisis. Uh, but then the Wilkinson's private sector role had been the CEO of a company that had worked with Exxon and Shell. And so no, it's not really any wonder that he was uh, sort of keen on fossil fuel expansion. Okay, corporate connections aside, it's just possible that some people, depending on their interpretation of the word crisis, might not feel like there is a climate crisis. Uh, while Canada lags behind other countries in terms of action, the pledged climate ambition of the world's countries would now lead us to perhaps 2.4 degrees of warming. And it's been suggested uh, that countries such as Canada might be able to weather that disruption without collapsing. David Wallace Wells has suggested, in fact, that the overdeveloped countries have increased their climate ambition just enough to probably save themselves. And that's a very dark and white supremacist leaning thought, but I think it's really worth considering. If Canada continues to burn through other countries' carbon budgets, it will continue locking in and increasing the suffering of others. Antonio Guterres, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, said really recently that the abdication of leadership on climate was criminal. And those were his words, that's pretty strong. And I don't mean to pick on just the federal government here. The feds aren't the only ones to blame. Uh, several Canadian provinces have truly retrograde records on climate. And as Seth Klein also said on Monday, not one provincial government of any stripe is tackling the problem anywhere near the appropriate scale. And I also don't mean to suggest that nothing good has ever happened in Canadian climate policy. Canada does, for example, have a small carbon tax that's set to rise and to become significant. Ontario closed its coal-fired generating stations many years ago. Quebec has banned oil and gas exploration and new drilling permits. And Thunder Bay has a net zero strategy. Lakehead, even closer to home, became the sixth Canadian university to announce it was divesting from fossil fuels. And that com uh, commitment was reiterated on Monday. It's just that with all of this, we're still on track to let the others do the heavy lifting, even just to get us to a world where Tuvalu and Bangladesh are mostly underwater. And I should say that I keep saying we as if Canada was everyone and as if everyone was equally responsible for the problem. In fact, wealthier Canadians and oil and gas corporations are disproportionately responsible for Canada, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And some in Canada are actively fighting to protect the climate in particular indigenous land protectors. Uh, for example, the Asipokdok First Nation opposed fracking in New Brunswick, the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Musqueam are opposing the Trans Mountain expansion, and the Wet'suwet'en have been engaged in a long nonviolent struggle to keep the coastal gas link pipeline from their traditional territory and have been violently arrested by militarized police and their camps have been raised. Now recently, a coastal gas link, uh, 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 CGL work camp was damaged. Uh, we don't know by who exactly, but it's an action that's sure to slow the project and raise its cost. And it's really unfortunate that individuals need to take direct, direct action to stop what no climate aware government would have approved in the first place. But here too, Canada is leaving the hard work to others. Academic uh, and climate activist Andreas Malm explains the ethic of this sort of direct action. He asks us to imagine people living in a high rise 
where someone has planted explosives in the basement. It would, he contends, be the right of those people to disable the explosives. And I would say we would likely call them heroes for doing that. Just gonna sc uh, screen share for two more slides and then I'll be uh, finished here. New research in nature of communication calculates that for every million tons of carbon emitted, uh, 226 people will die of the heat impacts alone. That's not the flooding, that's not the Zika, that's not uh, uh, war and disruption, that's just the heat impacts. Uh, this means that the Coastal Gas Links project with a maximum capacity of 5 billion cubic feet of methane per day, that would equal about 63 deaths per day, excess deaths. And Canada is currently determining also whether to approve the Beta Nord project, a 30 year oil scheme 500 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland. It would produce 200,000 barrels a day, but 86,000 tons of carbon dioxide. That's about 21 dead people per day. Okay, so we're over our carbon budget, but in a way we're not out of the game yet. We're, we're, we're down three to one in the middle of the third period and we're the Toronto Maple Leafs, but we could still rally and still push politicians to make some kind of a climate leader, or at least not much so much of a climate laggard out of Canada. We could radically raise our ambition, like Denmark, aim for a 70% reduction between 1990 levels to our outsized historical emissions. We need to rapidly phase out oil and gas production. We could pass the Strong Just Transition Act with the climate job guarantee so no one would need to fear losing their livelihood as we move to clean energy. We would need to cut most advertising, certainly for fossil fuel and fossil paraphernalia, but also because of the human suffering and overconsumption caused by targeting people to make them buy things. Almost finished, Doug. We would need to expand universal public services, including the caring economy and public transit. We need to make things repairable, ban planned obsolescence and food waste, and probably shorten the work week. The economist Jason Hickel is really good to, to read on this. And all of the things that we need to do, they're, they're actually pretty anti-capitalist. Uh, they make humans happy, connection with others, learning, being active and giving. And speaking of giving, we could transfer billions of dollars to developing countries in reparations for taking their carbon budget and for the damage our carbon has done and to help them build out their renewable energy systems and cope with climate change. We citizens get to choose now, not directly perhaps, but by the pressure we decide to bring to bear or not to bring to bear on our elected representatives. We can continue to let Canada leave the work to others, or we can step up and join people in Canada and around the world who are working for climate justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. As always, you inspire me and um, you inspire all of us. I mean, in the, in the face of all of this horrible evidence that you've shown us in the last uh, 20 minutes, you also maintain this air of optimism and, and hope. And I think hope is really what we need to, 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 to command in this case and, and make sure that we're uh, working together on a, on a similar kind of voyage towards the future. And so I thank you for that. Your presentation was wonderful as always. Um, I have one quick question. Uh, gasoline prices are going through the roof because of the war that's going on against the, the terror that's going on against the Ukrainian people. Um, and I, I don't want to give it any more um, talk than it needs. But do you think this is going to be a motivation, as a lot of people are saying, to move away from fossil fuel consumption, especially with cars? Do you think this is going to happen in Canada? I think we're at a pivotal moment. I, th I think we are at a really uh, it's a crisis point for, for many different reasons. Um, the spike in gas prices, uh, the, the instability, the the connection of what uh, energy does in terms of uh, creating the possibility for a political power. And mm -hmm. I, I think that I've heard lots of calls, but I might be in the cheese bubble of, you know, of, of climate people, I get those things in my inbox. Uh, but there's lots of people saying, you know, the best thing you can do to uh, just support Ukraine, but not not just immediately, but but in general, a fairer world is to, to, to think about moving off oil and gas in every way possible. So I, I think it's gonna give a spark to, to governments that might be able to say, okay, we need to do this also because, I mean, we have all these, the climate change reasons haven't been motivating enough and mm -hmm. the connections with fossil fuel companies have been impo almost impossible to break. And the fossil fuel companies that are celebrating this, they, 
now we're important again uh, from their, their big conference down in, te in Texas. Um, but I think there is a, a critical mass of people that are growing that are, are we just know it's not, it's, it's not sustainable. We, we can't live in this world as, as Pallavi said, we, we have to move away from capitalism and the profit motivation as, as the driving force. If we wanna be on this planet still 500 years from now and 5,000 years from now in any sort of an organized uh, way. And that, that is actually what gives me hope is that there is so much discontent with the system. And I would say even from some of the people who seem to be benefiting from this system, they know it's not, it's not tenable. We can't, keep, we can't keep going the way we are. And big changes happen in history and, and sometimes they're really good. Thank you. I, I couldn't help noting that the, the moment we discovered that we had a gas crisis, uh, Jason Kenney jumped in and said, we'll, we'll solve it for you. We'll just open up our reserves. And um, it's we have such a divided political system in Canada and the U.S. All over the world, there's this growing division between authoritarian style leadership and, and uh, what we used to call democracy. I don't know if we can call it that anymore. But thanks, Paul, for enlightening us. And uh, what we're going to do now is move to the Q&A section because uh, it is now uh, getting close to the end. And I'm going to turn over to uh, to Michelle Beaulieu. I just want to give you a little introduction. Uh, Michelle is uh, currently Associate Vice President or Vice Provost Academic for Special Projects and External Relations Associate, longtime um, professor of history, also homegrown. Uh, I, I knew Michelle when he was an undergrad, and uh, we used to talk on the corner of uh, was it uh, Oliver Road in uh, Balmoral? I think it was. And in any case, um, I, you know, you can look up Michelle's very impressive resume if you like on, on online. Um, I, but, but I just want to move over to him and uh, and get the question and answer period going. So, Michelle, take it away. Okay, thanks, Douglas, and uh, thank you, everyone, for the presentations uh, that you've done this morning. Uh, just a reminder, everyone who's taking part, there is a, a Q&A little bubbles. Uh, if you're using a, your desktop, it's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it'll appear in various places if you're using a phone or uh, an iPad. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is, is that I'm going to go through the generally the order that they've been coming in uh, during the session. Um, I will click a little button that'll appear in the Q&A about answered once I've asked the question uh, to the panelist. Uh, some of you may not see specifically your question being asked because there are a few that seem to be rolled into um, one uh, that can apply to all the panelists. So, um, you know, don't be offended. Don't be slighted. Uh, the question is embedded in there. Uh, and if there is a need for a follow-up with a specific panelist, uh, I'll endeavor to do so. Uh, so while we do start going through these, uh, please do keep adding uh, questions. So the first question is for you, uh, for you, Pallavi. Uh, what kind of resistance to capitalism do you see within the farmer population and or the, the larger general population within India? Um, this is a really good question and uh, <clears throat> I would like to answer it live rather than type it there um, because that's the option we have. Um, well, um, I think the farmers need to develop a kind of coalition with other people who are affected by capitalism. It's not just about climate change, it's about inequalities, um, what people are suffering as a result. And we've seen the inequalities affecting people even during COVID. So um, I think it has to be at a larger scale at the international level and not just at the local level. And, uh, and because capitalism, as we know, is a global system. Unless it's attacked globally, um, nothing is going to happen. So my answer would be the, the farmers would need to somehow come in, you know, into this global coalition that would overthrow uh, the system. Okay, thanks, Pallavi. And uh, uh, there's two more for you, and there's sort of a bit of a follow-up as well to that. Is Do you think the farmers in Nepal would benefit from growing hardier native crops as opposed to non-native crops that are less resilient to the climate? I mean, I know you focused on India, but the individual's wondering. I mean, you could apply this also to India as well, but uh, if yeah. you could... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Nepal is in the Himalayas anyway. So uh, <clears throat> my answer would be uh, not really. Um, um, using native crops because um, the contemporary climate change that we are facing is unprecedented, unprecedented and it's unpredictable. And there's a lot of uh, uncertainty attached to it. Whereas the native crops were grown over long periods of time, 
but people could make adaptations. The climate change we are facing now is anthropogenic as well as it is unpredictable. It's faster, much faster than anyone can predict. Those systems, when you used native knowledge, native plants, etc., were for a different kind of world where things could be predicted. But now you cannot predict. Even scientists are failing to predict much of the climate change. That's you know their models are not necessarily perfect. There's a lot of uncertainty. So I do not think native plants um, adopting native plants would uh, be a effective strategy. And, and again, going back to my point on inequality, I think inequality should be addressed. It's, it's, it's a part of addressing climate change. Without that, you, you cannot have, uh, you know, you cannot talk about resilience. I just don't like that word because it has different kinds of connotations, especially for the global south. Um, you know, it, 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 it completely brushes under the fact that uh, we're talking about inequalities and, um, you know, when people do not have the resources, how, how, how do you expect them to be resilient? How can they cope? Especially the vulnerable people. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Valdi. Um, this one's for you, Ron. Um, the question about if you could elaborate a little bit on the, the relationship and the history between Uruguay and Finland. And if you think this relationship is sustainable due to the large role Finland plays in the in Uruguay's uh, economy. Okay, well, I'll start by shamelessly, whoops, yeah, shamelessly uh, plugging a film I made a few years ago called Pulp Friction. You can find it on <clears throat> excuse me, researchtv.ca. You can get a seven day free membership uh, or subscription and you can watch it there. And uh, the film uh, deals with uh, three places, uh, Finland, Canada, uh, just outside of Thunder Bay and, uh, and Uruguay and uh, the shifting forest economy. So it's called Pulp Friction and researchtv.ca. Now, as far as the history of uh, Finland uh, in Uruguay, um, I th it's been really quite interesting. Uh, Finland is a, a relatively small country, but with a small population. It was described to me once as uh, more of a country club than a, than a country. People seem to know each other uh, a, a great deal. And um, the, um, uh, from the perspective of uh, the forest industry in Uruguay, uh, in many ways, uh, I'm, I'm thankful and I think Uruguayans are maybe thankful that it's Finns and uh, not some other company or country that um, has its uh, corporations in uh, uh, Uruguay. There are still multinational corporations. They're still responsible to shareholders, but there's, uh, they're Finnish. And uh, with respect to Uruguay, the Finns, uh, uh, well, first of all, the Finns don't have a history of, uh, or don't feel that they have a history of uh, being uh, imperialists. <clears throat> and so uh, in much the way that the Canadians uh, are shocked to if anybody suggests that we're acting uh, like imperialists uh, abroad in our mining industries and that sort of thing in Latin America. Um, but uh, in Finland, um, uh, early on, uh, Finnish academics took, uh, 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 well, first of all, they were upset, Finns in general were upset with Argentinians uh, essentially equating um, Finland with the United States or any of the other uh, imperial powers. Um, and so academics took up uh, took this up as a challenge and uh, started asking questions about uh, whether or not the Finnish companies were acting responsibly abroad. And so it uh, developed into a, a basically a national discourse and uh, corporations were put uh, on the hot seat by, by the press and, and uh, by academics in Finland. And so uh, it has to do with sort of Finnish pride and all the rest of it, but um, they uh, have invested very heavily in Uruguay. There are still real uh, major concerns about that investment and uh, the impact on Uruguayans, and not just in Uruguay, they've uh, invested elsewhere in places like Brazil, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that history is, is really quite new. Uh, it, uh, we'll see how it plays out because of course these are corporations and uh, tomorrow morning we could wake up to find out that Resolute uh, from here in Thunder Bay in Canada has purchased uh, one or all of the mills uh, in, uh, in Uruguay and uh, uh, Uruguayans would have to deal with a new uh, co corporate culture or a different corporate culture than the Finns. So the, the history is very new. Uh, Finns are very much aware of what their corporations are doing or try to be, make, maintain an awareness of what their corporations are doing abroad and they're not happy with what they see. And, and Finland has also suffered. Right? It's not just a question of uh, Finns expanding, but they've also lost their mills. 
Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's important to remember, it takes about 100 years for a tree to grow to optimal size in Finland, because it's uh, near the Arctic Circle, and it takes about 50 years in Canada, in northwestern Ontario, for a tree to grow to optimal size, and in Uruguay, it's uh, 10 years. And so, um, the, uh, the replacing the forests in Finland to make them profitable again for the companies is very difficult. That pulp from Uruguay sometimes makes it all the way to Finland to be processed into paper, etc. And uh, in Canada, regeneration takes uh, less time, um, but it still takes time. And uh, the the uh, the relationship between Finland and Uruguay and Canada and Uruguay with respect to forestry is uh, one that's going to take uh, a long time to shift to something else, maybe back to the north. Uh, but it'll take a long time to shift simply because of the advantages that Uruguay has and uh, corporations understand uh, competitive advantage and uh, are exploiting it in Uruguay and uh, many other places. Thank, thank you, Ron. Uh, so the next two questions I'm going to be asking um, are going to cover a few that have been put into the question and answer uh, area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to, uh, if each of you could sort of respond to it, I'll start with Paul, then go to Palvi, then go to, to Ron. And then the second question will just go into reverse order, Ron, Palvi, uh, and then end with Paul. So the first question that sort of encompasses a few of these is, it, uh, is that it seems to be such a, a long-term struggle to get governments and society to take climate change seriously. However, urgent action is required now. What can be done in the short term to cause real impactful action to address the threat? Uh, Paul, we'll begin with uh, begin with you. Thanks, and uh, I would say, um, you know, sci scientists have, have given us the evidence we need we, that we have to act, and and uh, the world is giving us the evidence we need as well. We 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 see the impacts of climate change everywhere, so it's it's no longer uh, any any sort of uh, thing that we need to convince people that climate change is happening or it's it's a big problem and you know engineers have also given us a, a, a zillion solutions uh, they've, they've made solar photovoltaic and, and wind energy basically cheaper than fossil fuels in most places where we're stumbling now is the politicians the politicians are uh, re remain for the large part unwilling to act at anywhere near the, the scale that we need them to to, to tackle the crisis and I think the only real answer is the answer that's been the same probably throughout history. I'm not a historian, but I know enough about, about popular struggles. And that is we need to get enough people pushing the politicians that they, they have to act. And that's not half the population. Uh, it's, it's, there's a suggestion that three and a half percent of people, if they're actively involved in a, a major struggle, can, can force really big change. So I think climate activists, uh, educators, all of us, it's incumbent upon us to, 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 to try to build this movement to push politicians to now do what we know has to be done. And I think one of the most effective ways of doing that is not talking about how horrible and tragic things are, although I think that's useful. I think the mortality cost of carbon, being able to put numbers on how many people are dying because of the projects we're trying to bring online in Canada, that will uh, speak to some people and, and, and be useful. But the co-benefits of actually making the transition to clean energy, back to Doug's question about you know, the, the, the invasion now of Ukraine and gas prices, we will be better off, we'll live in a better society, we'll live in a cleaner society, a more fair and equal society, when we make a lot of these changes that we know we need to make uh, to tackle the climate crisis. So that's where I think my energy is, and I, I hope lots of people are also starting to talk to cl about climate change with the people they know, because just talking about it starts to raise that push on politicians uh, to, to make the changes that are, are politically hard, maybe because you've got Jason Kenney and, and other people saying, you know, jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, if we had a great Just Transition Act, we could get, if we had real climate leadership, we, we would get rid of a lot of that opposition. And I'll, I'll stop now and let, uh, let the others speak too. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Pallavi. I, I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, like, Paul just uh, said, um, I think we need to engage in resistance, um, participate in something like the extent, Extinction Rebellion, because it's an existential crisis. Come on. I mean, um, we need to take note of that and I think come together and push for, uh, you know, corporations to not have such a big hold on our politics, on our society, to um, expose them, and and you know um, whether through research or otherwise, and 
um, as Paul was saying, that Think people we... get to know common people need climate crisis that we're facing so um yeah sorry is, is my am i getting cut cut off no i think i think we got the, the the crux of what you were responding to. okay i i think the system is resisting my resistance all right <laughs> uh thank you palavi uh ron well <clears throat> i think um <clears throat> With consideration for uh, for Uruguay and other countries uh, in uh, the what's called the developing world, <clears throat> the uh, it's a very difficult question. I think the simple answer is education and activism, uh, for sure. But it's very difficult for countries and uh, people in poorer countries. And Uruguay is considered a, a high income developing uh, country, but it's very difficult for people in those countries to um, want to make the kinds of sacrifices that we can suggest uh, be made uh, in Canada. Yeah, and so, um, and, and Uruguay is just one example. The forest industry is uh, spreading all over the uh, global south and uh, the Uruguayans are fortunate in that uh, they do have uh, governments that are responsive, uh, that they do have an environmental, um, um, uh, a not large number of environmental groups and environmental activists uh, that are active in the country and uh, they're highly educated. That's not the case in many countries of the world. And uh, the lure of, uh, of uh, revenue, the lure of jobs, uh, the modernity. Um, you know, the, uh, my work in, in Uruguay, I spoke to people who worked in the forest industry as laborers, essentially, and they were happy to be able to afford a, a freezer or, a, or an air conditioner so they could sleep through the so hot summers, uh, get a good night's sleep before going to work the next day. That's, that's the level uh, of uh, benefits that they were looking for. They don't uh, have to have the latest half-ton truck. They don't have to have a snowmobile and a motorcycle and a boat and uh, a, an RV and an ATV and a, you know all the rest of these things that, uh, that uh, we are accustomed to in this country. So the sacrifices, it seems to me, have to come first and foremost uh, here. We have to be conscious about what's uh, happening abroad, but also uh, appreciate that uh, we're in a far better position to, uh, to, to enact a legislation and, uh, and follow policies that, um, that uh, mitigate uh, climate change than uh, most of the people in the world uh, are. And, uh, and that's the, the challenge that we do have. Remember, eucalyptus trees are, that, those plantations are a huge uh, carbon sink. So there are sort of benefits to it uh, that, uh, that people can see. There are jobs, um, only about 70 in a mill that uh, replaces about five mills here with the equivalent of a thousand employees in them. Um, but that's, uh, that's the reality on the ground in a place like Uruguay. They would love to be in our position, but they're not there yet. And it's difficult to sell. Okay, thank you, Ron. Um, so we'll go reverse order for the next question. Start with you, go to Pallavi, and then uh, end with Paul. Uh, so the question is, who plays the more important role in protecting climate change? Politicians or scientists? And how do politicians and scientists work better together to protect the environment? Well, big question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure who plays the, the bigger role, but I think if you just look at what we've been through for the last couple of years with uh, the pandemic, Scientists uh, who I think should be listened to um, are, not, are being completely ignored by the politicians. So if you apply the same sort of attitude towards science of politicians uh, and science, uh, uh, climate scientists, uh, I think it's uh, the, the, this essentially the same issue. The problem is with the politicians not willing to listen to science um, and uh, or hearing the science and not willing to, to act on it for, uh, for whatever reason. But I think that is the big problem. And uh, if there is a, a culprit, it probably begins with uh, and ends with the politicians. Um, and I think what we have to do is we have to elect uh, more people and we have to push, push for more uh, uh, politics that recognizes that uh, science is important and not just science, but uh, the voices of, uh, of other people who aren't uh, necessarily scientists, um, but uh, can see with their own eyes what's happening around them and, uh, and want change wanted to stop. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Pallavi. Um, <clears throat> scientists, of course, provide the um, evidence that climate change is taking place. But in terms of going to the root cause of the problem, I think 
politicians and scientists are the same. They, they do not recognize that the root cause is the socio-economic system that's driving this uh, climate change. You know, uh, prior to the industrial revolution, um, if you remember the, is it called the Keeling curve, uh, Paul? I, I don't remember the, the graph that shows um, how much uh, carbon PPM has increased. Um, and uh, the, you can see from the dat data that it's uh, since the industrial revolution that this acceleration in um, carbon emissions and um, you know, leading to global warming has taken place. So the data is there, but, I, but the problem is that both politicians and scientists in, with regard to mitigating climate change are you know, basically the same. That's what my research has shown they do not understand the root cause. And uh, I, I do not see uh, in terms of um, either of them playing an important role in the long term. Short term, yes, technological fixes, etc., is what governments will propose. Scientists also will agree. Uh, remember, scientists are funded by governments. So there you see the, the, the connivance taking place. So I, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Pallavi. And uh, Paul? Thanks uh, for that question. Um, if, if we look at, I would say, if we let's separate climate scientists from other scientists, because climate scientists, I think, have done a great job of showing us the, the urgency and depth of the problem. And in fact, many of them have suffered from mental health challenges because they see what's coming and they see that the action isn't commensurate with, with the problem. And that's, that's even more stressful for the, the people that really know the data than it is for people who are, are further on the outside. But it's, a, it's interesting, I, like uh, Pallavi's answer makes me think about you know, science as part of the problem. Like we're here in Research and Innovation Week, but in many ways, re past research and innovation has taken us to this brink of, of, of environmental collapse, in fact. And so we, we do have to be suspicious of solving problems with the same tools that got us into the problems. I, when I teach climate change education, I, I'm very clear, I think that um, we have the technological solutions that we need already to, to, to move to a much cleaner economy, but we also have to take into account the knowledge of the ways we need to live on the planet. We can't just uh, uh, translate everything we do to new technology and expect things are gonna get better. We're just going to eat the world faster when we have you know, cleaner technology. We'll mine more because it's cheaper to mine, for example. So we do have to, to question the fundamental assumption. If we see everything as a commodity, we're, we're going to ruin the world for sure. So I, I think we, we but the, the, to just end, the politicians still for me hold the, you know, most of my disdain, I, I reserve for politicians who, who know or should know what's happening and they play their parts in continuing to have it happen instead of saying, I'm gonna risk what I need to risk uh, to, to, to make change. I'll fall on a sword if I need to and not get reelected or get booted out of cabinet because this is the biggest thing that's, that's, that's happening. People are suffering already. And it's my moral duty as a human to actually try to do something about it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, and thank you all for uh, those who've posted some questions and for the answers. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Doug, who's going to give some closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It was, um, I, we're right on time. Look at that. We, uh, we followed uh, the directions and we, we, we got to the end. I, I want to thank uh, Paul and, and Pallavi and Michelle and, and Ron um, for your contributions today. Uh, they uh, no question that that Lakehead University is is uh, producing scholars and researchers who are are passionately aware of what's going on in the world, and, and I think it's important that during this research and innovation week that we we highlight our own as much as possible. I, I think this is what the motivation was for this panel, and I also want to shamelessly um, uh, recommend that you visit the CIC site and join either the Thunder Bay CIC or the, uh, the, the newly minted uh, Simcoe County CIC so that we can get more folks around the table to discuss what we wanna, we wanna do in the future. So uh, to everyone, thank you again, it was great. Um, and I thank the uh, events research folks for putting all this together in a way that, uh, that worked. 
for us. Uh, I apologize for the changes in titles that went on back and forth for the last month, but I think we got to the final the, the final destination. Uh, and finally, I want to thank um, my good friend um, uh, Michael Stevenson, soon to be full professor of history. Um, not giving anything away there. Uh, he is a, a wonderful friend and also um, helped me organize the, the chapter of the Canadian International Council, which is uh, what CIC stands for in Simcoe County. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Ron, I know you have a meeting to go to. You got to get to your meeting. So nice to see everybody and take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks,